I'm Brick Chisel, and welcome to Fog Set News. Our top story tonight, sex cult leader Keith Rainier, the leader of Nexium, the sex cult, has been sentenced to 130 years in the penitentiary. He'll be experiencing a different kind of sex cult within the hard walls of prison. Quoted from one of his potential cellmates, it's going to be a rough transition. He's been used to being the stick, and now he's going to be the piñata. Political scientists have agreed that the Trump presidency will be counted as a gap year, and that part of democracy will not be counted for the final grade. In memorandum, Robert Murray has passed at 80 years of age. Murray, who owned the largest privately held coal mine, has passed away. He was on oxygen the final years of his life. Murray, who fought environmental groups and worker health and safety protocols all of his life. A huge Trump supporter, he once sued comedian John Oliver, who referred to him as a geriatric Dr. Evil. That suit went nowhere. Murray had been cited for safety violations throughout his entire career, and nine miners were killed when the Crandall Canyon mine collapsed in Utah. He claimed it was caused by an earthquake. One of the premier wine sommeliers, Jeff Kruth, has been accused of sexual misconduct. Over 21 women have had allegations against him for all sorts of unwanted sexual advances. One woman who agreed to have sex with Mr. Kruth described it as a sexual encounter in exchange for a recommendation. She said the experience was his erect wood had a distinct robust oaky flavor with a hint of coercion and a bitter aftertaste. Hello and welcome to Fogset. I'm Michael Meehan and we are pleased to have as our guest here at Fogset, a man who has traveled extensively around the world. He is here to tell us about his adventures. Please welcome Michael McVagis. It's McVagis. Please pronounce my name right. I apologize, Mr. McVagis. Uh, you've, you've traveled extensively around the world, uh, and you say you've uh, sampled exotic cuisines and foods around the world. Uh, tell us about that. That's correct. I've eaten penguin meat on Christmas. I've eaten seal, seal brains, even though they told me that there might be parasites. I didn't see them. My favorite by far was uh, camel, camel vomit. It's when you can't drink the brackish water. The Bedouin taught me. They say just force the water down the camel's throat and then use a stick and induce vomiting into a bag and we drink that. It's more appetizing than you'd think. Did you travel alone or did you have a group of people that, that went with you? You know, the team varied. Usually we'd start off with about 10, end up with about two, and those were pretty good odds, I'd say. Uh, how did the team deal with any medical emergencies? Well, medical emergencies are interesting, depending on where you are. When I was with the Inuit up in Greenland, my foot got frostbite, my toes. So an Inuit shaman offered to bite the toes off to ward off evil spirits, but I opted to take them off with a hammer instead. I lost my foot three months later. I guess our viewers at Fogset want to know, how were your relationships with the local natives you encountered? They started off interesting. You know, I, I learned that if you offer a ride to an Inuit woman, that's the same as propositioning her for lovemaking. And they would point to their hair, and if their hair was down, that meant they were menstruating. I didn't know that, and I picked up quite a few. I think I left a few descendants up there. Uh, when you say picked up, uh, what sort of vehicle were you driving? Was a was a truck or a sled or some? It was a sled pulled by cannibalistic wolves, or better known as huskies. Did you adopt any of the customs from the groups uh, and the cultures that you visited? The common practice when I was in with the Inuit was a husband would offer his bed and his wife to any guest. So that was something that was against my Christian nature, but I adapted and I felt like I could give her something that she couldn't get anywhere else. And what was that? 
Oh, that was uh, me sobbing in the corner and telling her my problems with my mother. I guess the sexy part of the interview. Uh, how did the team deal with any animal encounters? Uh, did you run into some vicious animals or out of control animals? Well, animals are interesting all around the world. You know, lions, they'll charge you. They put their, their ears back, and, but they'll stop a few feet from you, so you gotta have nerve. Do not run away. I learned that the hard way. They will come after you. You know, the fiercest by far was in Peru. It was the candiru or the vampire fish. Now they swim up your urethra when you urinate in a river. And I found out the hard way, you can't suck those suckers out because they're barbed. That sounds painful. Absolutely. Uh, as I mentioned, Northern Huskies are, are essentially wolves. I, I learned that the hard way trying to rub their belly. They'll pretty much kill anybody that they're not familiar with. They'll kill people they are familiar with. They'll kill each other and they eat each other. And one of their favorite foods is human excrement, I found. Well, with such a wild adventure, I'm sure that you have a book coming out. What's the name of the book? Well, the name of the book is Kiss of a Vampire Fish. Well, thanks to our guest, Mr. Mackle McVagus, his book, Kiss of the Vampire Fish, and that's going to be available in your local bookstores. Thank you so much for joining us here at Fogset. It's gone.
Hi, welcome to Fogset, Michael Meehan. My next guest is a man who's been on the program before, Theodore Fleener, but he is here to urge all Americans to plant trees. Welcome, Theodore. Welcome back. Oh, uh, yeah. Hey, thanks. Thanks for having me back on. Uh, the hundred bucks you guys gave me last time really helped me uh, <laughs> through some tough times there. Yeah. Uh huh. So, Mr. Fleener, you're saying that the sheer volume of books coming out describing the crimes and misdemeanors of Donald J. Trump are a cause for concern and actually responsible for clear-cutting some of our forests. I mean, uh, they're writing books about all the, 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 the people that he burned in real estate. Uh, then they're, they're all the women who have come out and said that he, he molested them or tried to sexually assault them or rape them. I mean, that's a load of books there. And then the, all the, uh, the, the, the books about uh, uh, his uh, government uh, policies of uh, like clear cutting and letting all these uh, people just pollute. Uh, I mean, that's, that's a ton of books there. And then uh, there's uh, then the impeachment uh, transcripts alone. I mean, they got to be cutting down redwood trees just for that. I mean, it's, it's huge. Uh, that's all I'm saying. Uh, Are there alternatives to cutting down trees to make them into the pulp to make paper? Well, yeah, I mean, we should be planting trees every day just to combat it. I mean, trees uh, sequester carbon, okay? Everybody knows that except for the people, in the, the people who don't uh, agree with science. And uh, those are the crazy people that people are writing books about. So it's part of the problem. But uh, what I'm saying is uh, you could use uh, like hemp. You know, they used to make paper out of hemp and stuff. So, you know, you can't smoke all that hemp. There's got to be enough left over to make some paper, right? I mean. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Theodore Fleener, for joining us here at Fogset. We look forward to a visit again sometime soon. Thank you. Hello, I'm J. Roger Wanky, and welcome to Insight, the program that talks with interesting people. My guest has been frozen for 9,000 years, recently discovered in the melting ice of Alaska and revived by the team at UCSF Medical Institute. He's here in our studios. Please welcome Ook Ook. Well, Ook Ook, as you know, many people are suffering from depression and we would like to know how you're feeling since you offer us a unique perspective of someone who's just recently been defrosted. Well, Ukuk, we'd like to administer the depression test, which was developed by Dr. William Zung of Duke University. It's a series of questions and they're scored from one to four. One being none or only some of the time, all the way down to four, meaning all of the time or most of the time. So let's get cracking with those questions. Shall we, Oak Oak? Ooh. 
Yes, go ahead and have a complimentary banana. Uh, Uku, don't don't lick the camera. Okay, the first question on the depression test is, I feel downhearted, blue, or sad. And of course, you'll score that one, meaning none or rarely, two, sometimes, three, many times, and four, all of the time. Ooh. One. Okay. Very good. The second question, I have crying spells, and I feel sad. Answer from one to four, ook ook. <coughs> yes, I know that the Arabs invented numbers probably after uh, you were around, but just take a stab at it. <coughs> one, okay, you have indicated one, ook ook. Very good. No, no, Uku. Yes, that's Wendell. He's not the opposite sex. It's Wendell. He's a man. He's a young man. I know. Yes. What? No, no, Uku. No, get off Wendell. He does not want to mate with you. Stop it. No, ook, ook, no. Please, for God's sakes, would someone get a tranquilizer dart or something on ook, ook? No, 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 ook, ook. Wendell does not want to make. Stop that. Stop that right now. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining Insight while we take care of this kerfuffle. Uh, my name is J. Roger Wanky, and thank you for joining us here at Insight. No, Ook, Ook, stop it. Stop it. I, right? Well, get the net or something on him. Wendell, oh, for God's sakes. I know you're worried. Spectacular things are coming your way. Hey! I know you're worried. I know you're scared I know you're unsure You're all too aware I know you're wrong How to survive Where do the world crash 
I am Dr. Heinrich Stumpf, and today we are going to look at the humor. Sometimes the humor does not work. Put this into focus. If the wife is not laughing, perhaps the joke is not funny. When the wife is not laughing, then you suffer from what we call kaputten the schnauze schnappen, or known as turning off the pussy faucet. You will not get any action at home if certain jokes offend the wife. However, if you tell the joke at work and they are laughing like crazy, then perhaps the wife does not like that one. Say you tell a joke, but you say, I cannot tell this joke because the wife does not like it. You will be accused of Craig schnappen und flogging, which translate into being pussy whipped. And that is equally opening oneself up for derision in the workplace or getting the sleeping on the couch at home. Those are the risks. So, the joke can be deadly. Recent events. Yeah, the joke by the French that did not go over well with the cartoon about the Mohammed prophet. Very deadly. Let me say this about the joke. If you are joking and 1.5 billion Muslims do not like it, well, that is a lot of hecklers, yeah? And especially those who go to the university of the beheading and then they lose in the street and they are angry because they did not like the joke. Hmm? If you offend a large part of the population with the joke, you could be in trouble. Here's a joke. The man comes home to find his wife in bed with a midget. He says to the wife, you promised you would stop sleeping around. And the wife says, can't you see I'm tapering off? Now, that joke is funny, but what about the midgets? They will not like that joke. But you do not have 1.5 billion midgets to come to the streets to protest. And if you did, that might be funny. But uh, they would not be doing the beheading unless they had the step letters, so they might be doing more ankle cutting. But still, that joke could backfire. Another joke. Two people who do not get along the Irish and the English. In Ireland, a man is on top of a building threatening to jump. The Irish policeman says, don't jump, think of your life. And the man on top of the roof says, my life is over, I have nothing to live for. The Irish policeman says, think of your mother. The man says, my mother is dead. So then the Irish policeman says, well, think of dear old Ireland. And the man on the roof says, I'm English. So the Irish policeman says, jump, you English bastard, jump. Well, that could cause some trouble between those two groups, yeah? Another example of the wife is not laughing. The cannibal comes home very late. And the wife says, where have you been? And she says, you have not eaten dinner? And what do you think he got for dinner? Cold shoulder. See, he's cannibal. He eats the shoulder so it was not cooked up. The joke is right there. Now, that might piss off, if I can use that word, lots of cannibals. And then they would go into the street and start eating people in protest. So you have to be very careful with the jokes. I will see you next time when we talk about 
Easy Humor beim Heinrich Stumpf. Thanks for joining. Hello, welcome to Fogset. I'm Michael Meehan. My guest today is a male dancer who wants to be designated as an essential worker. Please welcome to the Fogset Studios, Mr. Rocco Harding. Hey, what's up, man? How are you? Rocco, you say that you want to be classified as an essential worker. Uh, why is that? Well, you know, I provide a service that really uh, brings uh, joy to a lot of people. You know, I know people are bummed out and stuff. And uh, when I dance, uh, they feel happy, okay? I'm, uh, you know, I'm tired of, uh, like I'll be at Costco and uh, I see these firemen and these cops and these paramedics and these doctors and nurses, they just zip to the head of the line. And, uh, you know, I'm an essential worker too, okay? I'm out there busting it every day and I'm giving it all so people feel better about themselves. It says here that you have an outreach program, you work with senior citizens, is that true? Well, I do a lot of my dancing around senior centers. Uh, a lot of times they come out for their morning walks and stuff. And uh, you know, I just want to give a little joy to their lives, you know, just give a little zip because, uh, I mean, they're stuck inside and, uh, you know, I just want to give them a little sexy reason to live. So I understand we have some video of your dancing. Uh, can we see that now? And you say that it is essential work, but I see that you also accept tips. Hey man, I'm just barely getting by, you know, I'm an independent contractor. And, uh, you know, with, with my Obamacare at risk and uh, my PPP uh, uh, expiring, uh, I really got to work it just to make ends meet. You know what I'm talking about? Well, it looks like you've been doing male dancing for quite some time and it's taken a toll on your body. Well, you know, when you're a professional, you give it your all, and that's what I do. You know, I'm also available for uh, some light gardening and hauling. And uh, if you got somebody uh, to help me, I'll help you move stuff too. But primarily, I think of myself as a dancer. Thank you so much, Mr. Rocco Harding, essential male dancer. And now this. And I should be laughing and throwing yes. the money up. Yes. Okay. So little chunks at a time. Uh, yep, I got you. Beautiful. I gave a little smile on that one. I loved it.